Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I want to talk to you guys today about the Devil Wears Prada. Evan, you might ask, you're a gaming YouTuber. You play video games. Your demographic is 75% male. Yes, but I also have a girlfriend I love very much and that I watched girly movies with from time to time. In fact, I saw a clip on TikTok from the Devil Wars Prada that made me want to watch it. And I asked her, did you do like the Devil Wars Prada? And she said, I love it. And I'm like, great, let's watch it. And we watched it for date night. It was a glorious time. So just to kind of give everybody the plot of where we are, of where we are talking about, I'm going to be going through uh, the plot here and the nuances from the movie that I liked. And also I wanted to talk about my opinions about the movie. Uh, the whole, the, the quick uh, spark note summary of it is, is that by and large, Andrea Andy Sachs is a journalist, is an aspiring journalist who needs a foot in the door. And she applies randomly to Runway Magazine, Runway Magazine being the preeminent fashion magazine in the world. And as an assistant for the editor-in-chief, she does not know this. She just put out feelers everywhere and was trying to get a job anywhere. As such, she doesn't really know what she's walking into, nor does she really give a shit about the work. And over, and she gets hired randomly. Uh, the 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 showing the show is the the movie is shows kind of like uh, is the story of Anna is kind of like a is loosely based off I believe Anna Wintour, who is the editor in chief of some big fashion magazine I'm not aware of, and I think she's also the woman that plans the Met Gala every year. I might be wrong, might be conflating powerful women in, in the fashion industry, whatever. Point of the matter is that it is the story of Andrea, how she starts this descent into this job, and how it changes her, and how she has to make the choice on whether or not she wants to. She likes these changes. Um, let's. That's basically the spark notes, and I'm going to take you guys through the plot of the movie, uh, and I'm going to talk about my uh, thoughts I had during this, because I Meadow wanted to kill me. I kept pausing the damn thing and and making statements and questions and things of that nature. So from we're going to be taking the summary from Wikipedia just to make my, my life a little easier. Background is for the video is going for this the video or the video is going to basically be an assortment of clips without audio because God by God the god of copyright hates me. Um Despite her unfamiliarity with the fashion industry, Andy Andrea Sachs, an aspiring journalist who recently graduated from Northwestern University, is hired as a per as a junior personal assistant to Miranda Priestley, the editor in chief of Runway Magazine. Andy plans to put up with Miranda's excessive demands and humiliating treatment for a year in the hopes of using her connections from Runway to find a job more focused on journalism. Andy initially fumbles with her job and fits in poorly with her gossipy fashion-forward co-workers, especially Miranda's senior assistant, Emily Charlton. Yes, Emily Charlton does speak with a British accent, and yes, it is does sound as condescending as you would think. Af after a dry trial meeting in which Miranda berates her in front of the entire team... Um, so I want to be very clear here that the dress trial meeting where Miranda berates her in front of the entire team... I think ultimately, um, here's the thing. Aunt, uh, Andrea talks, calls it. Oh, I'm sorry. Like scoffs while they're talking in the middle of, of figuring stuff out, um, and she says, "Oh, I'm sorry. I just I'm not super forward knowledgeable of this stuff yet." And then, because here's the thing, right? Uh, Andrea was very flippant. You know, here she's like, oh, I just don't get the stuff yet. She look, she doesn't really like think highly of high fashion and things with it. Um, Miranda uh, then says, "That sweater you're wearing is cerulean." Cerulean, and then she goes into the history of how this color cerulean was made was made popular in something like oh three. This takes place in like oh five oh six. Um, uh, and talking about how such and such made this forward with this new high fashion idea which was then which was then amended to like to the next lower down where like people were enjoying it thought it was pretty trying it on different gowns and then in, in in basically going through this entire story on how the color of the deep the exact color of cerulean of the 
frumpy um, sweater that Andrea was wearing ultimately trickled down uh, from the people in that room making decisions for Runway Magazine to the to what Miranda said was the bargain basement where she bought that the, the clothes she got it from. She like it, 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 it you know to somebody who is not used to you know some, to somebody who's not used to that type of criticism. Um, what Miranda did there wasn't you know ber a beratement. It, 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 I mean, it was a, in a berating and mean tone, but it was more than anything an education. Andrea it was hired because she didn't know anything about this, and she was smart, and you know she. Miranda thought she could be different. This is a revelation from later in the movie, by the way, so don't worry about it. And, you know, it's it's very well known and apparent to everybody working there that she does not give a shit about the thing. Like, the fact that she wears, you know, not bad outfits, I would mind, but not high fashion, high femme, like, outfits shows a lack of interest and respect. That is the kind of the dynamic being done at play here. If you are a person who, it, 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 let's take it similar to uh, work, like a, a job. Um, you uh, work at like a grocery store or something, like you're a cashier at a, gro at, a, at, a, at, a, at a convenience store and you make sure that everything on the shelves looks proper, you take inventory, you, you make sure the count the money is good, and you know, there's a lot of work and, and meticulous effort and little details at our parts of the job. But when somebody says, Oh, you just work at a fucking you know, you're just a you're just a fucking grocer, you know, it you're like who has never, by the way, done the job, does not understand a little bit its eccentricities and there's a level of respect. It's the same thing if like you're a plumber and you and you talk and like you know all of this, you know, all of the spec numbers, you know, all you know, you know, methodology, and then somebody says, Oh, you're just a fucking plumber. You like it's it's you're just you're just tightening some pipes. It, it is a it's insulting. It's similar to the art world in a, in a way. When you are a you know, you're saying like here is a picture, here is a uh, installation display I made of like there's to do an allegory from me at Chicago Institute of the Art, um, or to Chicago uh, Art Museum, which my girlfriend was Chicago Institute of the Art. She showed this to me. There's a pile of candy on the floor, and to the uh, layman, it looks like a pile of candy. But when you read the plaque next to it, it's it's like, oh, this is the, this was the uh, the artist behind this made a made this installation uh, because their partner during the AIDS crisis turn into a hollow shell of themselves and it, the the entire installation is just a pile of candy on the floor that just says take one and it's you know in 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 the in the in the slowly dwindling pile of candy is supposed to uh represent the dwindling you know just the deterioration in the in shellification of a you know of a human being that he loved and so by and large right all of this is kind of, and this, and this was a kind of scene that, but that made me shift from thinking this is a bad boss to this is a interesting boss, an interesting character, and this was this was this aspect was carried through and in, in the back of my head throughout the this entire film. She goes into Andrea here not because you know she's being mean or or argumentative or, or nasty. She's doing it because you know. Andrea, whether she knows it or not, just insult like you know, in, you know, was very invalidating of the art form and the work that they're doing. You know, it's it it, it is it's like you it, it is like you go to a master painter, a master tradesman, a mass uh, like a, an expert programmer, an expert in their field, and say, eh, it's just whatever it is. I do, like I don't get it all yet. I'll get there eventually. It, it is a flippant. Um, the insinuation is a flippant uh, invalidation of you know the the actual effort and work and skill and, and time and and, and 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 dedication to a craft and you know later after this berating you know berating uh, Andrea goes to Nigel the art director of Runway 
and had to help her t- and to educate her a bit on the fashion industry. And you get a, a montage where she gets makeup done up, like dress clothes, and she walks back into the office to do her job. Miranda sees her, looks her up and down, and you can see a shift because the the respect that both Emily, her senior, and Emily senior, who's there too, who 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 like she's replacing, you know, comment that she looks good. She, and, and she's do and, and she has accepted um you know it like it, it shows a shift in a respect of you know the world that in in, in, the, in the in the industry she is now working in you know and and that was like one of the subtle changes that I thought really kind of stood out. Again, note after noticing Andy's change of parents' commitment, Miranda begins to get her more responsibility and complicated tasks to handle. So, one of the things that happens here that that what is eventually Miranda is given the right to uh, do some to bring her the book. The book in this case is basically the book of like the day, all the day's information, the new art, the new. Um, designs from different artists it's basically compiled in, in at like around 10 30 at night at 10 and then the second the, the second assistant the junior assistant is meant to deliver them the book to miranda's address um while following some very specific rules you put you don't go upstairs you you don't speak you're quiet you put dry cleaning in the pick up the dry clean beforehand close it in the closet and put it on the table with the flowers so ultimately, and ultimately, you know, this is, you know, some, like one of the mistakes that Andrea makes. Miranda's daughters be like, hey, come up. And Andrea, being a dumbass, actually comes up and is seen by Miranda in the middle of a fight with her current husband. And um, unfortunately, you know, after she, you know, delivers the book and runs like a time scared mouse out she is basically tasked by miranda to uh i need you to pick do x y and z and also i need you to find uh, my daughters just finished the sixth harry potter book i would i need you to uh i need you to get a copy I need to, I want, they, I want, they want to find out what happens at the seventh Harry Potter book. This is Harry Potter and the Deathly Hollows, by the way, the fucking man you, as it isn't out yet. And so what she ends up doing is basically through, you know, basically a guy that she finds means that, like through one of her many different, like, um, through one of her many different, like, rompades trying to, like, do tests for Miranda, she meets this blonde hunky dude who's one of the love interests. And uh, he, she basically calls him, asks for a favor, and says, "Hey, uh, can you get this manuscript of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hollows for me?" By this point, it's just Harry Potter Seven on the. We don't even know what the fuck it's called yet. And um, he gets it for her. Now, granted, before you know Miranda left for you know another thing, she said, "If you don't get that manuscript, don't bother coming back." Here's the thing: if there's one thing that Miranda has shown throughout this throughout the, the show is she, the things that she asks, she asks a lot. She asks a lot, but she doesn't ask for anything impossible. This morning, the junior assistant, Andrea, that she hired, she asked for a manuscript that was probably one of, that was probably one of the most kept, best kept like documents in the world, a stake from her favorite place that wasn't going to be opened and that wasn't going to be open for another three hours and she wanted it in 15 minutes uh, going running across town to get her fresh coffee and pick up a bunch of uh clothing items from a supplier these are all these are all tasks that are while some might be normal they are all varying level at least two of them are varying levels of possibility she basically is able to convince the steakhouse to the people doing the prep work to stop their prep work and make a fucking steak. She gets the steak. Miranda says, fuck it. I don't want it. If you don't have that manuscript by the time I'm going to go eat lunch with my husband. If you don't have the coffee and, and if you don't have coffee with my coffee and you also don't have the manuscript by the time I get back, don't bother even returning. And she gets it. Not only does she get it, she makes multiple copies, sends two off 
with with Miranda's daughters to visit their grandma, and a, a third one to to, to put uh, in front of Miranda to told you so. An absolute hail mary. Miranda does not ask. One of the things I notice about Miranda's asks throughout the movie up until this point is she does not ask for things that are not feasible. The only thing that I thought that was feasible, like infeasible, that was she was unable to do was getting her home by morning for a recital while she was down in Florida in the middle of a hurricane. But here's the thing. When Miranda doesn't strike me as an unreasonable woman, she does not... She When, when, when Andy wasn't able to get a... Um, when Andy wasn't able to get a plane down there and, and she had to wait a day to come back, she didn't fire Andy. Her reputation had, had been purported in this movie thus far to be the type of person who would fire Andy if she didn't get, you know, what she wanted. But she didn't. She asked an impossible thing of Andy as get, getting the fucking U.S. Air Force to airlift her out. Nothing was going to get her out of Florida at that point. But then you get to the point where she sa she says explicitly, if you don't have this Harry Potter manuscript... Don't bother coming back. Miranda in this at that at the at that point did what like was trying to get her to quit or or or, or fire her. Why? Because Andrea crossed a significant boundary. She went up the stairs. You're not you're, you're not she wasn't supposed to. She was told explicitly not to, and she listened to two 12-year-old girls and did it anyways. The fact that she was able to get the Harry Potter manuscript showed a level of resourcefulness on her part that uh, Miranda was like, you know what? You can stick around. Fair enough. It was a Hail Mary for sure, and it was impressive. So at this, this was when I realized that Miranda is not a, she is a absolutely a demanding boss that asks an, under, an overwhelmingly inappropriate amount from her two assistants. I frankly think that like, if she's going to ask, demand this much, she would need three assistants, three or four assistants, to make shit run. Because putting this all on two people is, it's inappropriate. And it's a type of uh, work-life balance that is not necessarily respected in year of Warlord 2023. Four, four days of no, days of no purpose anymore. Regardless, um... But moving on, um, after she does this, she, um, after she does this, she, after Andrea, like, succeeds in this, we're in a, in a frankly impossible attack and did the impossible, Miranda keeps her on and starts liking her even more, especially as Andrea continues absorbing the runway philosophy and becoming even more glamorous. This is, um, also resulting in her boyfriend at home, who has been, who's been with her for for almost two decades has you know been supportive and is a is a line cook uh at some fairly bougie restaurants and he's you know i think ultimate and in, in, in they're constantly having issues and fights at home you know andrea's coming home very late i must remind you that like she lives in new york so she's got access to like decent public transportation stuff of that nature so she's able to move fairly quickly you know she has to she picks up the book at 10 she picks up the book uh, she delivers the book, the, the book that she has to deliver nightly to uh, Miranda at 10.30. And by the time uh, she gets home, it's probably like 11.30. You know, it's probably 11.30, you know, by the time she gets home and the ladies. The most unrealistic thing about this film is the fact that her boyfriend and her partner, a line cook, by the way, is home, pants off, and pass the fuck, you know, try, falling asleep in bed and shit. Had asleep by 11.30 in New York. A new, working at a New York restaurant at a semi-bougie restaurant. And he's working, and he's, and he's asleep by 11, he's asleep by 11.30. That is the most unrealistic thing in this movie by fucking far. Um, so that's currently what we're doing. And, and, a, and a reminder that Nigel did say to her that 
you know, like oh, when she when Nigel when she when Andrew's confiding in Nigel, she's like, yeah, I'm having trouble at home with my boyfriend. It's it's the hours are difficult. And she says, and he's like, oh, it sounds like, uh, it's, it's it, that means you're doing well. Once your life, let me know when your life goes up in smoke. That's when you usually do for a promotion. So you know that that's kind of the work environment. That's so not good. Miranda Miranda would certainly do better to hire another two people to help offset the load because having two people do it is just not appropriate. Um, regardless, uh, Andy become and, and Andrea or Andy for short routinely seems to uh, outperform Emily, her superior, specifically when when Andrea started has an onset cold due to the fact that um, she has you know was just ill. I want to remind you, just a heads up, that this movie is unbelievably fat phobic. Um, if you were to take a shot every time they said something like fat phobic. In, in that in any like anything fat phobic by five minutes by ten minutes into the movie uh you'd be drunk and by the end of the movie you would be legally dead so that is something to bear in mind for anybody who's sensitive to that kind of stuff also i don't know it's, it, it feels bad man i digress um emily is ill not doing well it's all, also specifically because she has been you know effectively have like enabling anorexia with like like heard the diet descriptions of what she was doing were basically eating disorders, um and as a result uh, she is ill she is not doing well and uh as at, at her as well in her job and Miranda basically says hey listen uh I'm going to be taking you to Paris Fashion Week as my assistant instead specifically when you know at Gala, at a gala stateside, uh, Emily at, was flubbing the name of people that were coming up. Andrea and Emily, the purpose was to memorize the itinerary book, research all the guests, so that whenever uh, somebody came up on, to say hi to Miranda, she would know exactly who be, she would know their names and who they are. And that's the types of reference. Um, Emily flubs this during the gala. Andrea swoops and saves the day. Is after this that Miranda basically says, "Hey, listen." Um, Either you have a job here, continuing, you continue to have a job here, or you, you and come with me to Fashion Week, or you can leave. Because Moran, because Andy basically said, Emily has been waiting to go to Fashion Week, consumed by this, for all year. And um, after she basically accepts it, um, she, Miranda throws her bag and coat onto Emily's desk. By the way, the th throw the, she usually throws the coat and bag on the desk of the second junior, the, the less favored assistant. This is a subtle sign showing that Emily is less favored than Andrea, and Andrea has to unfortunately call her, call Emily, and let her know that, hey, sorry, your dreams are now crushed. Um, unfortunately, while Andrea is doing that, and, you know, Emily is currently, like, running a billion fucking errands for Miranda, she gets hit by a fucking car and breaks her leg. So now, in the hospital, Andrew now has to break this news to Emily while she is recovering in the hospital. So, that is very sad. Regardless, things move on and they go to, uh, and they go into, uh, Fashion Week. They go, they, and Miranda takes her to Fashion Week. Regardless, Nate, her boyfriend, uh, has anger, is angry that she's going to uh, Fashion Week. Her friends are mad at her because she saw blonde one pretty boy for, who got her the Harry Potter parents who kissed her on the cheek. And basically, ultimately, in a nutshell, Andy has kind of, like, lost, like, her social circle like, of, her, of her three, her two friends and her boyfriend as a result of this, which is no bueno, to say the least, but, you know, time moves on. In Paris, uh, Andy is generally doing everything so that she can, keeping up with pushing until they get back to the hat until they get back to uh, the apartment, the, the the place where they're staying, the house they're staying, where Miranda reveals to Andy that her husband filed for a divorce, lamenting the loss of another man in her life. Um, and later that night, Nigel, who is the name of the pretty boy who gave her the manuscript, who she has a one night stand with, tells her in the morning. 
that he has accepted a job as creative director with Rising Designer. Or not Nigel, I'm sorry. I, I mixed up Nigel and the name of the other dude. Um, Jackley, uh, um, Christian was the name of the pretty boy. Nigel is the runway art director. He he's actually got the um he actually got the he actually is after 18 years of working for the runway magazine, he is going to be instead of working with uh, one of the designers at ABC, James Holt, um, as a creative director, and he's going to be excited to have and he's so excited he's excited to have the uh, a future. And where he gets to decide his own, make his own decisions, and he's super excited for that. Um, unfortunately, after we're after the some drinking and some party and like going out and celebration, she goes home with Christian Thompson, who, um, who after a one night stand basically says to her after after she sees a a mock print, um, for the new uh, runway uh, thing, which she's like, where the fuck did this come from? I've been privy to all of the like the next three issues covers of Runway, like, where the fuck is this coming from? And Christian Thompson, her pretty boy, pretty boy, basically tells her that Jack Lee Follett, who is, um, by the way, we meet at the gala in America, is, is, is Miranda fucking hates her because, uh, you know, just, she's just, she's in charge of French, France, Runway, uh, Runway, Runway France, and they just really don't fucking like each other. Um, Andy attempts to warn Miranda, and according to uh, and to her shock, she admits, like, Andy literally spends the entire day trying to get a hold of Miranda and let her know what's happening. Um, and when she does, when she finally lets her know, she's like, oh, look at these flowers, they're lovely. Um, I, I, I'll just make sure that there's none of these flowers for, for this benefit. And Andy's like, what the fuck is going on? Ultimately, um, Andy, it, and Andy, uh, they're they're at the James Holt, uh, the James Holt again being the designer we see earlier on makes an entire design thing, and he's being honored um, at, at, as he starts his new venture, and Miranda announces that, and it makes it sound like she's going to announce the new creative director to Holt, well, as Nigel, but in in a twist she announces it as Jacqueline, the woman she hates. Why would she snub? Her longest running, like like fuck over a man who has been by her side for eighteen years working with her, and has been quite frankly the as we see over the over the course of the movie the most reliable uh, employee and and in and, and confidant she has at, at runway. Well, if it, it, it's it, it's it, Andy is repulsed. We'll, we'll see in a little bit. Andy is basically repulsed, repulsed by this by by this action because Miranda explains she already knew the plot to replace her and sacrifice Nigel to keep her job. Andy's repulsed and says, "How could you do that to Nigel? I could never do it to Nigel." And Miranda says, "You could do it. You could do it. You've already done it. You did it to Emily." She said, "I'm never thought I would say this to anyone, least of all you." But you remind me of me when I was when, when I was younger. Yeah. <laughs> they leave to go to a, another fashion show after this. After she after Miranda basically says, "Listen, like you're like well, like me and more than you think, and you have to sacrifice everything to be in this business. I've sacrificed everything." The implication being the la like her last marriage that just fell apart because she was never home. Um, and the fact that she never sees her daughters, the fact that she has sacrificed everything for this career of hers. Not wanting to become ruthless like Miranda, as Miranda walks up to all the, all the photography and stuff, Andy gets out of the car, turns around in the other direction, and walks off. Miranda turns around looking for Andy to see where she is. He, she turns around to see that Andy's gone. Andy was walking away. Because and and just kind of like with a sort of like sad and sad disappointment look, turns around and smiles and keeps moving forward. When Miranda tries calling her, Andy tosses her phone into the Fonte de la Concorde, basically the big ass fucking fountain in the middle of Paris. Google it; it's okay. It's okay looking. I've seen it IRL. Later, Andy meets up with Nate, 
he tells her he's now sous chef, and, uh, sous chef and they agree to keep in touch. The same day, she has an interview at a major New York newspaper. The editor recounts how when he called Runway for a reference, Brandon told her that Andy was the biggest appointment she ever had as assistant, but he would be an idiot not to hire her. After getting the job, Andy recalls Emily and reconciles her by offering her the clothes she obtained in Paris. And while walking past the runway office building, Andy makes eye contact with Miranda and waves at her. Although Miranda does not acknowledge Andy, she smiles for herself once she's seated in the car. I think, I think this movie, it was very good. They're all, they're currently working on a sequel some tw almost 20 years after the original one. But I will say that, like, my final thoughts, which I've kind of been interspersed throughout this, by and large, I do genuinely, genuinely enjoy the movie. I love the portrayal of Miranda Priestly. I, she is, I, my biggest criticism of her is, is the overwhelming workload she puts on two assistants. Like, she needs at least three to four minimum to be able to, then to share that load. It's deeply inappropriate for her. But otherwise, I think, like, ultimately she is a, Aside from the pressure, the, the uh, it, it, you know, workload aside, I think Miranda, like, or Mail Streep's character is, you know, not a bad boss. She, they remarkably fair, open to educating in their own way, and, you know, while, you know, the impossible, to, like, like not, and not punishing people for, uh, firing people or punishing them for necessarily for, um, you know, not being able to complete impossible tasks. And the only time that she was going to fire somebody for an impossible task was because that person, you know, crossed a pretty important fucking boundary. You know, so I don't know. I think, I think, I think Miranda Priest's character is interesting. I would love to see more of them in the sequel. Obviously, there probably doesn't need to be one. It's a good product of its time, but otherwise, I, uh, I thought that. Um, the Devil Wars Prado is a really good movie, and I liked it a lot. Um, if you haven't, if you are, you know, one of my normal audience members and you haven't seen this, I definitely just consider going to see it. Or go to watch it yourself. Like, I think you can find it on HBO Max. Otherwise, um, I think, I think it's definitely worth worth the watch, and it's also, I think, a worth going to watch even after listening to this review if you haven't seen it already. There's a lot of nuance and subtle things that I did technically leave out, and Honestly, I think it's worth the time. Um, it, there's a reason it's you know one of the one of the most beloved movies of all time, and it's one of the and halfway in Meryl Streep's you know, late greatest works. So definitely give it a shot. Um, hey, thanks for watching. If you want to you want to talk to me outside of this video, outside of live streams, or just be a join the community and be a part of it, you can do so at hivmedia.gg slash discord. Discord links there. We'd love to have you and. Given the financial situation of the economy right now, I know this is a tall ask, but if you have the scratch to, to spare, please consider donating and becoming a supporter at himedia.gg slash tip. All of our perks are serviced through our Discord channel, including early access videos, exclusive videos, and more. Your generosity is a blessing, and a dollar a month is a boon to my bank account. Thank you so very much for watching. I appreciate you, and have great day.